Right. So, um, first of all, I'm going to say I'm very happy to be here finally. It's been uh, a couple of years of, I guess, uh, postponements uh, for obvious reasons. We heard about Titanic. Um, and uh, at the same time, and that's not in any way to, um, you know, to criticize anyone in the room, perhaps, or and certainly not the organizers, but I'm also a bit frustrated uh, to be uh, here listening to, to much of the conversation because, and I'll get to that, uh, things are going too slow. And I'm going to be a bit of the climate extremist in the room and say a few things to that effect. Firstly, briefly on Bologna, I think many of you know Bologna from before, founded in Oslo, Norway, uh, 1986, also probably the first NGO, one of the first organizations in the world to work on CCS back in 96. Um, we, of course, here now talk mainly about CCS uh, for, uh, for industry, which is also one of our starting points. But in 96, we started working on this um, mainly on gas power in Norway, but in a very different way from what we saw happening later in Europe. Um, namely, for us, that was always, and I think that's where it should have been placed, it was always the basic license to operate requirement for power by fossil fuel. And I think that also needs to be widened to other sectors going forward. Um, so we have offices in different places, Brussels uh, office, the EU office I'm heading. Uh, we have colleagues working also out of Brussels, working on Central Eastern Europe, on Belgium and Netherlands, we'll get back to that. and to um, and also on, uh, we have uh, some folks in the UK, in Germany, in, in Berlin, and the headquarters in Oslo, which also cover some work in Nordic countries beyond that. So, uh, not going to spend a lot of time talking about Bologna, uh, rather go into something which I found this morning when I was trying to put together some slides. I was looking at some really old stuff, and that's back to my comment earlier. This is a report that was published by Zero Emission Platform in 2013. It was the first time a zero emission platform, which started out looking at the power sector mainly, looked at industry. I was chairing uh, that working group together with a guy called Tore Torp. Some of you might remember him. Probably uh, uh, the one guy, I think, working in Statoil at the time, who sounded more like he was on our payroll than on Statoil's. Good man. Um, he, um, he was also one of the guys who pushed for the zero emission platform to go move away from the power sector only and think about industry. And we had a set of people from every industry uh, sector in Europe represented in that group. A lot of them put also their names and affiliations on uh, the report. It's still downloadable from, from the website. The point is, the stuff that is in there is the same as we're talking about today. So why is this relevant? It's because it's a lost decade we're talking about. We have not done anything about industry in the last decade. And we have to stop you know, coming up with narratives and excuses for not doing stuff. So. There were some, some conclusions in this report that we might have written differently today. And I'm going to go into you know, reading it for you. But again, those points largely hold true. CCS is the only available technology that can deliver deep emission reductions in several energy intensive industries. Um, yeah, this is a map that we drew up in 2014. And again, it looks familiar, but only now we're starting to do this work. We are 10 years behind the schedule that we knew we had to do 10 years ago. And everyone seems to be way too comfortable with that. And I'm not criticizing you guys. I know you're all working hard to move this agenda, but we need to work a lot harder because we lost a decade and we had no decade to lose. So. Um, we did this joint call for action. Uh, Laureen, my colleague here in the back, I think you heard her uh, some questions earlier, um, has been leading that work together with our colleagues in Berlin, uh, trying to get industry to speak up. Because part of the problem of what happened in the last decade is that much of the industry that needs to decarbonize has been very comfortable not having to do that. Free allocations, all these things we know we don't need to discuss here, I think. But the point is, finally now, industry is speaking up. Maybe because the pressure is on maybe because shareholders are starting to ask questions, a lot of reasons for them to do so, but it's been taking too long. And um, we want governments to talk together. And that's why we did this joint call to Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany to start thinking about how we do this in a way that works for society, that reduces costs for society, because this is about something that society is going to need. So. Um, you might have seen from the list of companies here that there was one sector that was conspicuously absent. 
the steel sector. And I'm not here to point any fingers, I'm just saying they weren't there. And there are many reasons for that, um, but some of it, I would say, unfortunately, is linked to what I described earlier as narratives that have stopped us from doing stuff that we can do now in order to do some stuff that we might be able to do 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years from now, which we cannot afford. So um, in the case of Tata Steel, and all the Dutch people in the room at least will know that story quite well, I think, um, there's been a lot of uh, things happening. The last year we had a decision uh, coming out of Tata and the ministry to go for what is generally known as the direct reduction route, um, using, at least on paper, hydrogen, green hydrogen, ideally, uh, to cut emissions from steel, moving away from coal. Great, awesome, except one thing, there is no plan. There is no plan to get all that hydrogen. And we did a case study on this, uh, which you can find on our little website from pollution to solution, Org, which we're trying to fill with little case studies looking at all the stuff that's being proposed by various sectors as climate fixes and look at the numbers, look at resource requirements, look at timelines and try to understand what is actually being proposed. So this is not to criticize DRI or it's not to criticize Tata or it's not to criticize hydrogen. It's just to ask where's the plan? Who is going to provide all the renewable electricity that is going to run this stuff? And we know that Tata says, well, you know, until then, we're going to run on gas. Now I think they might have to reconsider that one too. But this is the same for the whole steel industry. Tusenkop, Salzgitter, they're all saying the same. They're going to run on gas until they have the, the hydrogen, but there's no gas. So what is the climate plan? Are we now looking at a steel industry that's going to do nothing for the next decade because there's no gas and there's no hydrogen? Or are we going to do stuff that we can do in the next couple of years, which brings us back to what Tata initially had planned? I'm not saying that CCS is the ideal fix for steel. I'm just saying we don't have another decade. Okay, so, uh, sorry if I'm getting a bit agitated here. Um, this is not only about steel, I'm not trying to single them out. Uh, cement sector, um, there's been a lot of people talking about, you know, should we use electrification uh, for cement, should we use uh, hydrogen for cement? Um, even the cement sector itself, uh, Cementa in Sweden had a project, I think they're still going with Vattenfall to electrify the part of the cement production which is linked to heating. Uh, so, uh, you know, the basically about 40% of emissions come from that. I'm going to show you just quickly some figures here. Um, what you see here is, I'm not sure if I can point here, can I? Oh. Oh. What you see here is current cement production. Uh, this is the energy requirement here. So this is shows how much energy they're using at the moment, electricity, I should say. This is the emissions. We are saying about 0.74 tons of CO2 per ton of cement. Then, if you would do CCS on this cement, you would double the uh, energy demand in order to drive the CCS process. You cut the emission to close to nothing. You might even get to zero, but then you will have a little bit more energy use. But it's just to show you know, the relation here. Then, the electroheating that's been proposed might work in Sweden because they have a lot of renewable electricity. They also have a lot of nuclear that they're talking about using for this. But they're also talking about using it for steel and every other sector then you will cut some of the emissions, about 40%. You're still left with this stuff, and you have a lot more energy use. And then, if you're going to do CCU for fuels, which is something that a lot of people in the cement sector are talking about, and I'm not, again, saying that's necessarily wrong in every case. I'm just saying, let's get the numbers on the table. You see, this one has been cut, and it's cut here, because this is six times as high as this. Six times, okay? So it would just way out through the roof to do CCU for fuels from cement that will cut the emissions at the cement plant, but still will have some emissions here at the uh, car engines that are going to burn that fuel. So just, again, put this in perspective. Same steel sector, we already showed some numbers on that. Uh, and then the chemical sector's own plan for decarbonizing says that just to do CCU for, uh, for, for chemicals in Europe, you need more than twice the entire electricity production in Europe today just for chemicals. And that's not renewable uh, production, it's everything. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying there is no plan. So we need to ask these people to come with real plans. Okay, so this is the report from SEP. Again, uh, I'm a vice chair of SEP, I should have said. Uh, so I've been quite involved in some of this work. It's been quite helpful, I think. Point out a few things. Now it looks like I'm changing topic entirely. This is the other big part, which unfortunately is driving so much of our work. 
apart from exposing some of the narratives and proposals that don't come with numbers and don't come with plants, we also work a lot on what I would describe as carbon counting. Follow the carbon. So people talk about CDR, uh, negative emissions, we've been talking about it for a long time. It's linked to CCS, or it should be at least. Um, and we know we need it for the future. But there's so much confusion. Some people call CCS uh, carbon removal. Some people call CCU carbon removal. So we worked with, um, with a professor, Andrea Ramirez Ramirez from the University of Delft, and um, another uh, lady who's a PhD student who's now working for us, finished her PhD, um, to get in place some clear requirements and principles for what CDR is. And one of the key principles here is this one, it has to be permanent. If the CO2 is not permanently taken out of the atmosphere, it cannot possibly be a removal. But there's so much confusion, that's why we have to point this out. I'm probably going out, running out of time, I'm enough. I'm going to quick, quickly finish. Um, and so that brings us to CCU. And I hate the term CCUS. I really hate it. Okay? And I hate it because it is something that conflates two things that aren't the same. It's not to say that CCU cannot be relevant to the climate, or is that it's wrong. It's just that CCS is something that you only do for one single reason. It's climate action. There's no other reason to do CCS. CCU can be industrial process, can be really interesting, but you have to follow the carbon. You have to look at the accounting in order to figure out whether it's climate relevant. And you also have to look at, of course, all of the energy input and all the research requirements. So let's just have a quick look before I finish at the numbers of the CCU lobby, the Global CO2 Initiative. They made a claim a couple of years ago saying that, and this is the Paris uh, Agreement commitments, four degrees temperature rise, that's basically what it sums up to. And this is a two degrees uh, target, and they said 15 to 20% of that gap between the four degree world and the two degree world can be fixed by CCU fuels. Okay? So, Aside from the point about where the carbon goes and following the carbon, let's look at the numbers that they're putting in. They're saying, and let's take the extreme uh, scenario here because that's the closing the gap. This is the 2030 goals that were between 0.07 billion tons and 2.1 billion tons, quite a, quite a gap between the two. But okay, let's take the extreme scenario where they say this is 20% of the gap between a two degree and a four degree world and see what it leads to. It means you need all of the electricity generated on the planet today to do that. So why is no one asking this question? Why is no one exposing this? It's not to say that CCU fuels are wrong and that they can't be interesting in many cases. But these narratives are bullshit, if you pardon my French. And we need to make that clear because otherwise we lose another decade. So that's what we're doing. And um, finally, and this is a key point that is linking to what Michelle was talking about, and we work a lot together on this, and I think it's a key message to, in particular, the Dutch and the Norwegians here. Um, CO2 networks have to be managed as a public good. And that means that we can't, as long as there is no functional market, we, you know, we heard Joella talk about market maker earlier. I don't think there's a proper market maker yet in the Netherlands. I don't think we have a functional market for CO2 storage. And as long as that market doesn't exist, we have to treat this as a public good, and the public has to be engaged in how the ownership is set up, how, who benefits from this. So we're going to go back quickly to the Victorians. So, sorry, can this is my last slide. No, but for a numbers guy, so 10 minutes is 10 minutes. I know, so I know. You're crazy about numbers, but minutes is not really you're your quite thing. Right. Eh? Okay, yeah, sure. You're right. That's why I asked Michelle to go first, because sure. otherwise I would ruin her presentation. So, okay, I'm going to finish. The point is, these guys understood something which I think we all need to understand about CO2 infrastructure. This is something society needs. They understood that in London, when people started dying, first of all, the rich folks just moved away from the river, right? But once people started dying in huge numbers, once there was epidemics going around, people started realizing that this is something that we have to fix as society. And what we're doing now is basically the same as they were doing then, dumping CO2 in our atmosphere. So. That's why this has to be treated as a public good that should not be left to the decisions of companies that are used to 20% return on investment in everything they're doing. Society has to be 
in the leading hand. And with that, um, this is my colleague who's leading our work in Netherlands, Belgium, and North Westphalia. She's back in the room here as well. Please get in touch, and thank you so much. You will, you will be joining us in a couple of minutes in the panel. I have one question uh, sure, first. Please. please. Everybody's walking away from me. I, I don't know why. <laughs> Every time you're, you, you're criticizing people very harshly, then you say, I'm, it's not to criticize. So I'm very <laughs> curious, when do, when do you do criticize? What happens then? That's a fair question. Do uh, you explode on stage or what? <laughs> what? I am, I'm probably close to it. You know, at some point, when you've been dealing with this topic for 10 years, and it's been a bit of a walk in the desert, I guess. Um, not much interest for a long time. Now it's all coming back. And again, 10 years of time. No, no but we heard. But I mean, you're trying to be polite. You're criticizing very hard. Because we have to work together to sure. do this. Yeah. That's the point. Okay. I mean, antagonizing people doesn't fix it. Okay. The thing is about Tata Steel, I will uh, give some of your answers because I think, and I hope you forgive me, you're being very harsh on Tata Steel. And I will explain later in the panel. Okay? okay? We can have a discussion. You can have a discussion. I will help just a bit. Great. Okay? Cool. Jonas Helset, ladies and gentlemen.